Hi, I'm going to talk to you about the introduction of Week 8 in The Artist Way by Julia Cameron. I only have four more weeks to go, you guys. Oh boy, this has been a doozy, kind of like a love-hate relationship. Uh, well, not really hate, just kind of love-dread. There we go. <laughs> a love-dread relationship. Um, and again, it's my third time doing it. <laughs> Although I don't really remember a lot of it in my previous times, which kind of tells you where I was at. And this time through, I see it a total different way. Like she keeps referring to creativity, the artist and the creativity. And I always thought that to be painting and drawing and sculpting and singing, music writing, whatever, right? The creative outcomes, products is how I always saw it. And I never considered myself to be a creative person even though I had been told over the years about my writing and blah, blah, blah. But I never considered myself an artist because I didn't draw. I couldn't paint, couldn't make something. Anyway, besides the point. Um, but now I'm starting to realize that the creativity that she speaks of is our ability to manifest and create our reality, that we are creations and that we are creative. And when she talks about the artist, you know, the little artist inside of you, that's our inner child. So I don't know. I've been really able to pick apart things that she's talking about and put it in line to what I'm learning. And but another video, no, seriously, a truth video coming up is going to talk about what I'm currently learning and how I grew up. Because <gasps> it's very similar. I'm starting to see. Weirdly, of course, I'm sure there's not a lot of ackiness that's in what I'm learning now, but whatever, that's in our topic. So hit subscribe <laughs> and then the notification bell thingy if you want to learn about that painful truth video that I will be making about this aha and oh shit moment and my childhood upbringing beliefs and what I'm learning now and how they're actually kind of colliding, <laughs> but melding right? Anyway, off topic. I'm sorry. Okay, so let's get back to week eight, uh, recovering a sense of strength. So basically, she starts talking about survival and how an artist actually has to learn how to survive an, an artistic loss and how loss could also be, you know, loss of hope, loss of face, money, time, people, whatever it may be. But we need to be able to acknowledge that loss and then recognize that out of that loss comes gangs gangs and strengths right what do we get from it which kind of really links in with the whole gratitude piece that i speak about so much about out of a situation that may have happened that you feel you were wronged or hurt right what do you walk away with what are you grateful for because that changes everything being grateful and having that gratitude lens, when you reflect back on your life and your past, you can actually change your past. Yes, you can. I know people are going to argue with me on that one, but I'm telling you, you can change your past. It's all with gratitude. But that's another video. <laughs> okay, so back to the artist way, <laughs> Julia Cameron, week eight. As you can tell, this was kind of a hard one for me. So anyway, talking about being able to recognize that, you know, your artistic loss actually happened, being allowed to mourn it, grieve it, talk about it, share it. And she says that a lot of artists don't do this because they feel silly because it's an art thing, right? Because of the stigma that is attached to it. You know, I guess 30 odd, 40, 50, 60 years ago, being an artist had some kind of stigma. But you know what? I'm thinking nowadays it doesn't as much as it did before. I mean, look at how the arts community and programs and, you know, the possibilities, opportunities have just like, poof. when I was in school, we didn't talk about going to art school, right? So it's really interesting. I think times have changed and the book, although it's really great, we could kind of change it up a little bit to reflect the current state of affairs. <laughs> okay back on to this sorry okay so she talks about all that and then basically how those hurts those pains when we don't express them and acknowledge them they turn to scars and then that's going to be our artistic block years down the road <laughs> um but 
one thing I could not believe that she actually said is that she links the artistic loss um, to what a woman who had miscarriages would feel. She says, women who have miscarriages, as does a writer, suffers terrible losses when a book doesn't sell. Just like a woman who lost a baby would go through that grief. She's saying that it's comparable. I'm not sure how I feel about that, and I'm pretty sure that probably wouldn't be in the new edition of the book, is what I'm thinking. Um, but she does talk about a reminder how our artist is like a little child, and we have to remember that we, our artist in us, can't handle intellectually what the big adult would handle, um, and we're more emotionally going to be affected. So that was interesting concept there. Um, so basically, you got to acknowledge that you had these losses, and then you've got to, you know, mourn them, so it doesn't become a barrier to your future dreams. Okay. She then speaks of, you know, uh, us being childlike, not childish. There's a difference there, um, and we can accept to learn from criticism when it has truth. But when it really hits hard in the art, artist, you know, and it impacts the artistic loss, is when that criticism does, is contained in judgment. Hmm. And I guess that makes sense. Judgment hits harder, right? Because she, she kind of shared it, whereas, you know, maybe you did something, wrote something, whatever, and someone says, oh, that's really good, but the line could have been whatever, whatever. Um, you could go inside and like, yeah, actually, oh, they're right. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh-huh, I see that. And so that criticism, of course, isn't going to be painful. It's only painful when it's attached to or perceived as judgment. And that makes total sense to me outside of this whole artistic thing, just in life in general, right? When do we get hurt? When is our exposed or our core beliefs exposed? When we're judged, when we feel threatened and judgment makes us feel threatened and that gets you into survival brain. Like it makes so much sense. Okay. So anyway, she talks about that. Um, oh boy. <laughs> but then she talks about emotional incest. Wait, what? I know, right? That's a thing. It is. Yep. She basically says that when we're younger, right? Um, most people who are like an authority to us would be like our teachers or, or could even be editors if we're working. Um, it could be parents, mentors, that kind of thing. And when they pass judgment on us or they violate, you know, our belief, you know, think that we lack potential or we hit a limit or we can't do better or whatever it may be, but they don't have belief in us that is equivalent to the feeling of betrayal and mistrust and uh, does the same damage as if it was a parental violation and she means that to be incest <laughs> right okay and you know i understand and this is a kind of struggled with that one because i'm like okay mm -hmm. i kind of understand why maybe she's She's trying to make it sound like if an artist suffers a loss of his, his art, you know, or has like a criticism that's in judgment and how that could like, you know, break the trust of his mentor. Or, you know, I, I get it, but I don't know if comparing, you know, your mentor, art teacher, criticizing a painting or a writing that you did to grandpa molesting you. Mm, I have a hard time with that, but we don't need judgment. I pass no judgment and everyone perceives their own experiences differently because it's their experiences. And so I'm trying to let that go. But when I first read it, I was like, seriously, my God, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's almost there. Remember she was talking about the homosexuals a couple chapters back. Yeah. Oh, you don't remember that? Go back into my other artist way videos. There, I just did a plug. Look at me. <laughs> All right, anyway. And basically what she's saying is that when, oh, go, when you're uh, 
your mentor, your teacher, you know, someone that you looked up to criticizes and not appreciate your artwork, that just leaves you feeling ashamed, feeling like you're a fool for even trying. And she kind of links that to sexual harassment. Th those are her words. Um, the teacher's belief of you lacking promise or limit on your talent is like sexual harassment. I know, I'm only reading, so this is, <laughs> that's here. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> so yeah, maybe you wanna check it out, week eight. Okay, but I did start to have some aha uh -huh moments um, through this work, through the week. Like a lot of really cool things have been happening. I've been making a lot of growth and self-discoveries and being able to take what I'm learning and actually implement, implement it into practice or learning like, oh my God, did you know that like casting a spell is just manifesting your reality? Hello, you could do more than one thing? What, what the fuck? Yeah, that's a whole other video. So a lot of good stuff coming up. Look at me doing all these plugs. <laughs> okay. Anyway, but what I actually kind of figured out from all of this, from week eight now, what I'm realizing is that we are all artists, every single one of us. You don't have to be a painter. You don't have to be able to play guitar, write music, write a novel, whatever it is. We are all artists and we all create our reality. Ooh, that's kind of exciting. Anyway, okay, so that's enough of this. What else do I have here? Um, so she does talk about the ivory power, right? And about how basically in universities, colleges, schools, that art is not really celebrated or encouraged. And if you are artistic, they kind of try to push it aside. Academics always trumps art. That kind of thing is what she's going with. And there has been changes in that for sure, as I kind of mentioned. But again, this book is what, I think 28 years old. Um, Anyway, and then she talks about your your gains disguised as losses. So that whole gratitude piece really comes in when she talks about that. I, I believe it. I practice it. I say it all the time. People hear me, right? When something happens and it hurts or it exposes, you know, a wound inside, core belief, whatever it may be, something really shitty happens because shitty things happen, right? Hard things happen but you can go through it with ease, all with the gratitude lens. And then you just ask yourself, right? Okay, where do I feel supported? Uh, what am I grateful for? What did I walk away from, from that situation? You can always, because you can change your past. It's true. You can change your past and how it impacts you in the future. Anyway, so she talks about every ending is a beginning. We all know that, um, but you know, we often get stuck on it. What else is she here? I really liked how she talks about the trick is to metabolize pain as energy. So again, it's that whole vibration, right? And our energy and putting out into the universe. And so if we can use that as good energy and not bad energy. So I thought that was good. Um, she does quote a film director, John Cafazetz. In order to catch the ball, you have to want to catch the ball. This is the whole idea of what I've been practicing about if you want something to happen, you have to do it. If you don't start it, it won't get finished. That is a piss off, believe me. I've been saying it for years. Like, fine, I'll do it. Because if I don't do it, it won't get done. <laughs> I'm no longer doing that with such, <clears throat> I'm kind of celebrating. It's the first step, but you gotta do it. You wanna have a business? Hmm, you gotta come up with a name. You got a name, you gotta register the business. You know, you gotta get business cards. Like there's so many things and if you don't do it, oh, me just sitting here saying, I wanna have a business isn't gonna happen. You gotta actually take steps to do it. So that's kind of what she was saying about that. Um, and then there's another quote here by an Oldenburg, Claus Oldenburg. She has it at the side, as you can see, yep. And it, she, the quote kind of goes, art is a technique of communication. The image is the most complete technique of the communication. Okay, but art is a technique of communication. Wow, right? 
I know. To me, that's communication with the source. Art is coming from within. And if it's coming from within, then that's like connection with your authentic self, which is the source. Woohoo! So I totally celebrated when I saw that. This book is just really kind of solidifying. I don't know if that's what I mean. What I'm working on, what I'm believing in. It gets so cool what's happening right now, how my upbringing and my past and my, my craft and the language and working that I'm learning now, and it's all the same. <laughs> It's all the same, just presented a little differently, but it, oh my goodness, I've known this stuff the whole time. Okay, anyway, one thing I really like that I did come out of this again is um, turning that, why me? Why does this always happen to me? She didn't say it like that, I did. But anyway, but why does it happen to me? So instead of saying, why me? Actually, you know, in your morning pages, which I'm still doing, yay me. But um, instead of saying, why me, this sucks, blah, 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 blah. And remember, writing that and thinking it and speaking it, that's putting the energy back out there. We don't want it out there because we don't want it to come back, right? So why don't you ask yourself, what next? How can I change? What can I do, right? And then let things flow that way. Because I, I like that. I really took away from that. Um, did I write that in here? No, I did it somewhere. Oh yeah, here it is, ah, here it is. So that why me to how, right? How can I make this better? How can I change that? How can I get what I want? Instead of like the poor me boohoo victim stance. What is next? Instead of saying why me, what is next? Um, and that would be like the key to resilience, which she talks about being self-empowered and having choice, right? And she talks about not taking no for an answer. And if you can't do it one way, then do it the other way. Uh, so I kind of like that. It kind of got in line with that. And I'm going to do a video on that whole reframe too, because I liked it, like a shorter one. Credit to people who watch though this long. <laughs> okay. Then she talks about age and time and product and process. You know, that whole, I'm too old for that, or um, I don't have money for that. And she calls that a great block lie. <laughs> and how we use that to prevent us from exploring. And if we don't have new experiences and we don't have change up in our lives, our brain is actually not developing and growing, right? So yeah, I'm too old for a film school or I'm too old to write a book. Um, she said that it's always used to avoid facing fear. Again, procrastination, you know, avoiding. What are you fearing? Why? So I thought that was pretty cool. She talks about how we always say, oh, I'll, but at the flip time, she talks about how we say, oh, I'll do that when I retire. When I have more time, I'll retire, I'll paint, I'll do this, whatever it may be. And how that she says that doesn't happen with creativity. Creativity is movement. Ha! Huh, right? That's where I had another, I know, creativity is energy and we want it moving. And because what we put out there comes back to us. We create our reality. Very exciting. And so movement is timeless. And so even when we try to put it off, it's still not happening. Art is about doing, not done. That's creativity. It's about doing, not done. I like that. So that's pretty good. And then, of course, she does throw in the ego piece, which we need to know. So be aware of your language. I am writing a screenplay, right? Versus I have written a screenplay. That's ego. And so that was very interesting. But she also had brought up before, and as we know, with even us creating our wants and our desires, it's unlimited. It's never ending, right? And that's just like art and creativity. It's never ending. You could always add on, make better, change up, build up, down within, however it may be. It's never ending. But it's what we end it to be. And we take what we've learned and we go to the next one and make it better and more fabulous. So focused on process, our creative life retains a sense of adventure. Focused on a product, the same creative life can feel foolish or bare. Hmm. Like the whole manifestation. I learned something the other day, but I knew all along, but I learned. 
you have your desire, you feel that emotion of what it would feel like to have it, then you let it go and don't care that it's going to happen, which is hard if you want it really bad. But if you let it go, it happens. Interesting, hey? I know. It's like a spell. <laughs> oh my God. And you can do it more than once. You can do it all the time for anything. It's, oh my goodness, so much going on in my head right now. So if I thought that was really cool. And if we don't release that desire, then we're not going to get it because we're focusing on the lack. And that's what I'm learning from Abraham Hicks. Two lenses. There's the abundance lens and the lens of lack. We don't want the lens of lack because that's what brings, that's what's coming to us. I want to like take those off and like smash them and rip them up and never have them on again. But awareness is the first step to that. Okay. Um, what else are we good here? Uh, and then she talks about filling the form, which is, of course, actually doing it. So if you want a job, in order to get that job, you actually have to fill up the application, right? That kind of thing. So, and but a really good one, she says, you know, people want to do art, whatever it is. Oh, I don't have room for that. I don't, I don't have room. There's no room in the house. I don't have a place to go to. I don't have a studio, whatever it may be. So she said, for example, filling in the blank, or what did she call it? I'm sorry. Hang on. Oh, filling the form. <laughs> filling the form could be cleaning out a room or a corner of a room or like a countertop or whatever and put in your stuff there. That's starting it. And that's the way you manifest too. You just put it out there and then you just got to like do something to make it happen. Your actions need to align with what you want. Because if you don't, how's it you're going to get there? It makes so much sense. Anyway, again, it's that creativity requires activity. Energy requires movement, right? Um, yeah, so I think that's pretty good. And then she talks about some stuff about most blocked creatives have an active addiction to anxiety. Eh, well, I'm not going to even go there. <laughs> but anyway, that's where that was. I'm at 22 minutes. Okay. Mm, this is my video. I can go as long as I want. Hit subscribe though. If you if you held on this long, hit subscribe. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so she does have some exercises in here that I'm going to talk about because they're not the tasks. Now the one exercise: early patterns and exercise. We all know I can't remember a lot from my childhood, although I'm starting to remember some things. Thank you to the book, but I will do the best I can. All right. So basically she has these questions, right? And I'll just fill in the blanks for you, which I did right in here. <laughs> so let me find it. <laughs> there we go. All right. And it starts off. As a kid, my dad thought my art was blank. That made me feel blank. I didn't have a dad, right? <laughs> You know, there was a somebody who was with the woman who gave birth to me. Papa, we call him. I never called him Papa. My boys did. But, yeah. No, sorry. I can't even. I don't know. I don't know. I remember one time when he, again, didn't know him. Never met him. I felt very blank and blank about that. I never forgotten it. Hmm. Okay, again. And even when I try to replace it and put somebody else in there, yeah, no, don't remember anything. As a kid, my mother taught me that my daydreaming was blank. And you know what? I don't know. But here's the thing. I actually thought about this one because I can't daydream. Let's change that. I'm learning how to daydream right now. It was something I could not do to, to dream. Because uh, I would always, that can't happen. What are you, stupid? That's ridiculous, you can't do that. What the fuck are you even doing? You're waste, wasting time. <laughs> oh my goodness, that just came out. But wasting time daydreaming. Now, I don't know if that's something the woman who gave birth to me said to me. I don't know, maybe someone else did. Like, I don't know where it came from, but all I know as an adult I didn't daydream 
I don't know how to daydream. I didn't know how to play. I didn't know how to play. My kids. Anyway, so I, I don't know. But something tells me that clearly <laughs> daydreaming was not encouraged. Otherwise, I might be a little better at it. Okay. I remember she'd tell me to snap out of it by reminding me blank. Couldn't tell ya. I really tried to think about this, especially when I started to make a connection about, wait a minute, if I think it's a waste of time or I think that, you know, I should be thinking smarter things than things that can't happen. Somebody might have told me that when I was younger, but I do not know. Um, the person I remember who believed in me was, I actually remember a man and a woman. There were a couple. Um, my uncle, David, and my auntie, Eleanor. They weren't really my uncle or my auntie, but I called them that. But I know they believed in me. I remember my uncle telling me when I was little that I could do anything I wanted to do. I could be anything I wanted to be. That I was beautiful, that I was smart. He told me those things when I was really little. And I remember that. Like, I really remember that. And then, um, I remember one time when, I remember one time when we were picking dandelions and he was picking dandelions for his wine and I was picking dandelions for my perfume. <laughs> and I remember, and I remember, as it says here for number eight, I felt safe and happy, safe. I was happy and cared for, loved, connected, excited. Um, what else did I say? Yeah, loved is what I said, safe and loved about that. Picking those dandelions. And I never forgot that. So much so, yes, I actually have <laughs> dandelion tattoos. I do. It's one of my happiest memories, the dandelion picking. Anyway, and then so I also did it. Notice the three stages of the dandelion, right? First of all, like the, so you have the maiden, the bright yellow. Then you have the mother, which would be with the seeds, or, pardon me, with the seeds right there. And then you have the crone, which is with the seeds being blown off. Right there. You can't tell me we're not connected. That is so awesome. And you can see the three goddesses and so many other things throughout nature, but that's another story. Okay. Um, the thing that ruined my chance to be an artist was I didn't know I could be an artist. <laughs> I think that would be really easy to say, but I didn't know. Um, and if I didn't know, uh, so obviously I wasn't encouraged, it wasn't celebrated, it was never a thing. And I started actually thinking about that. It wasn't a thing when I was in school. Uh, the negative lesson I got from that, which wasn't logical, but I still believe, is that I can't blank and be an artist. Well, I don't know. <laughs> That's just it. Where I came from, it was like an artist, a writer, a director, an actress, I don't know, sculptor, whoever it was, was like on a different planet. It wasn't spoken of. It wasn't acknowledged. It wasn't celebrated. It, I wasn't encouraged. So it didn't really exist. It makes so much sense. And so I grew up thinking artists were blank, flaky people, uh, not serious, non-existent. <laughs> I don't know. From like, are dead? <laughs> artists are dead because all the art that I knew were from people who were like dead. I, I don't know. The teacher who shipwrecked my confidence was, oh, do you guys know? Question. 13 here, or not question, but I guess statement 13 of this exercise, the teacher who shipwrecked my confidence was Miss Guthrie. Yeah, I'm calling it out. Yeah, I know she's dead, but she called me stupid. Really? In front of everybody. What the hell? Who does that? A teacher? Yeah. Anyway, 
<laughs> and then 14 was, I was told. Oh, I just told you that. 15, I believed this teacher because everybody said it. I heard it in all environments. I knew it to be true. 16, the mentor who gave me a good role model was, there was, I can't remember when I'm younger, but I don't even know role model. Like, I never really had anyone. But I would look at just people and see how they were living, how they responded, how they behaved, what they were doing, and how they made me feel. And then I would try to do that too. Yeah. I had to learn how to react and respond in some situations by watching other people, how they responded. And if, they, if everybody was laughing, oh, I should laugh too. If everybody was sad, okay, I better be sad too. Right? Anyway, that's a whole other video there too. <laughs> okay. When people say I have talent, I think they want to, they want something from me. And what talent are they talking about? Do they think I'm that stupid? Oh, see, that was the old thoughts in me. But yeah, seriously, if you said I had talent, I'd be like, for what? I can't sing. I can't draw. I can't paint. Like, what am I got talent for? So anyway, I would think, well, as she says here, the thing is, I am suspicious that they want something from me. They want to take something from me is what I'd be thinking. They want to fool me to get something from me. Um, 19, I just can't believe that, and what did I say here? I said, believe, oh wait, let me, I want to make sure I get it right. I just can't believe that people want my company with nothing in return. That was the old me. <laughs> that was a belief that I carried for a long time. You know, nothing comes for free, nothing comes easy. Go, oh, there's always a catch. And usually it's something you don't want. <laughs> um, but I don't believe that. And I don't see that now. And I don't feel that. So, yay. Although I still have a little bit, it's not gone. Like, I gotta work on it. I can't do it overnight. If it took like 48 years, you know, right, believing it, it's gonna take a little bit to try to correct it. But I'm aware. So, yay me. And then the last one, mm, yeah, I know. If I believe I am really talented, then I'm mad as hell at blank and blank and blank and blank. <laughs> you know what? I am talented because I'm creative because I can create my reality because I make potions <laughs> that work. They really work, by the way. When you use them, they work. And, you know, I have a talent for growing plants and I, I can write. I'm really good with words. So I have a lot of talent. And you know what? I'm not angry at anyone. I'm not mad as hell because that is wasted energy. So people in the past who did not encourage me to be the artist that I am, to realize that I'm an artist, I forgive you. I have no anger towards you. I'm celebrating where I am right now. So I'm good with all that. And that's how I ended those questions. So um, she does have affirmations that she wanted you to pick. So the ones that I picked were, blah, 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 let's see. Oh, oh wait, um, what were they? Okay, um, creativity is a blessing I accept. My creativity blesses others. My creativity is appreciated. I now treat myself and my creativity more gently. I now accept hope. I now act affirmatively. Those will be my new affirmations that I will add in. But I'm going to do a short video on this new affirmation that I created that I absolutely love and I want to share with you. But that's all it is for right now. The Artist Way, Julia Cameron, you who credited if you guys lasted this long. Have a great night.